Let's give a big round of applause for Dr. Nordstrom for joining us here today. Let's pretend that there was a thousand people doing that too. Okay, we're yay, good. Yay, <laughs> yay. Amazing. Perfect. Thank you. I'm see if I can share my screen. Who can share all panelists, maybe? Would you help me here, Jordan? Let's see. Gives me a few different questions. to share my screen. There we go. Share sound. And well, thank you very much for attending. I'm very excited uh, that so many people are interested in this subject that I find very interesting and I've been working with for about 15 years. And I'm actually doing my second PhD in this field uh, to understand uh, the completion of the fight, flight, freeze response, how we can recover from adversity and build resilience and hopefully live a richer, even richer life. So that we'll spend 90 minutes about uh, to, to dig deeper into that. I'm happy to answer questions throughout the seminar. You can post your questions in the Q&A and then we'll get to them. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, resilience and recovery program is what I call it. We, we recover from our past and move towards resilience. But uh, and this is a picture of when we work up in Colorado with the military personnel to downregulate their nervous systems. But before getting into that all, uh, I was thinking to share a story uh, when I'm 15 years old, living in the Middle East, a kind of put me on this track and starting to uh, become more interested in recovering from war zones. War zones. In my childhood, I lived in Sweden, uh, where a Russian submarine went on the ground and was about to become war in Sweden. Then, then I lived in the Middle East uh, during the first Gulf War. My dad worked in the military there. So we have pictures of Scud missiles flying over our balcony. And then I served about five years in, uh, in the military in war zones like Afghanistan and, um, and uh, Kosovo and got more and more interested in how do we help our soldiers to recover after adversity? How do we help other people to recover from stress and, and such? So that will dig deeper into. But when, when I lived in the Middle East in Jerusalem at this time, uh, my brother, uh, was actually kidnapped and um, he was out walking in the eastern city of Jerusalem and he and his girlfriend and two more people that they were friends with start to talk with a person who um, becomes gradually more and more threatful so this person kind of forces my brother and his friends to follow him to a uh, first through a narrow, narrow alley and then into an um, abandoned house or uh, apartment where he keeps them for a few hours and um, he has weapons and uh, being quite threatful. So my brother is, of course, very, very stressed and concerned and afraid. And uh, after a while, uh, the perpetrator becomes threatful to one of the girls in this group. And at that time, uh, my brother seizes the moment to escape. He's a fast runner, so he, he charges away from there. And we can imagine being in there for a few hours, all the tension and nervousness and how the brain and the body reacts to kind of deal with that situation. So then running is all prepared to run, charges away. He finds a military jeep with IDF personnel from the Israeli military and uh, military police. So uh, after a while, 20, 30 minutes, he returns with the police to, uh, to the location where the perpetrator held his friends. And a few minutes after my brother ran away, he kind of got concerned. So he left my brother's friends took off from there and realized that it could be 
potentially dangerous for him. And I, after that, um, I kind of returned to that story when the more I learned about trauma, because just a few months ago, I realized my brother never developed any stress reactions after that. He didn't develop PTSD or even like afterwards, like he was talking about it, he was describing the event, but it seemed like he was doing quite all right. So I actually asked him this summer when I was back in Sweden visiting family and friends and such, my wife and my two and a half year old daughter, we go back there for the summers and asked him like, like have you, how, how did you feel afterwards? Do you ever think about what happened? Did you have nightmares and such? And he kind of cash, casually like, no, not really. Yeah. Interesting that he asked. I haven't thought about that in a long time. And um, and uh, a while ago, I read in, in another book, in a, in a book uh, by Peter Levine, a great book I can recommend, In an Unspoken Voice, uh, something similar happened where a, a, a perpetrator kind of kidnaps or holds hostage about 30 students or school students age about seven eight or nine everyone kind of de develops stress reactions except for one person and this person was a boy who succeeded in escaping from the room where they were all kept hostage and afterwards, the psychologists were kind of interested to understand how come the boy didn't develop PTSD while all the rest in the room, let's say it was 25 students, all had quite severe symptoms and reactions afterwards. Um, so what they kind of uh, concluded was since the boy completed the flight response, he didn't develop, develop stress reactions or PTSD. Same with my brother in Jerusalem. When he returned with the police, first he escaped, kind of completed the flight response. And then he returned with the police and kind of helped the police actually to, to find the perpetrator. So they drove around for a few hours in Jerusalem. My brother is 15 years old, sitting back in the back of a military police Jeep. And eventually they find the perpetrator and uh, the police go, like exit the car and uh, arrest him so that was kind of a completion of the fight flight freeze and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today could it be that we are developed to uh, deal with trauma to deal with awful events and that evolution actually has helped us and uh, developed different parts of the brain and the nervous system so that we can learn from adversity and even thrive and that that might be a, a crucial part of uh, evolution how a species develop uh, throughout time so we'll talk about three sections of the uh, nervous system uh, when we are socially engaged the baseline and then fight flight and then the freeze faint mechanism and uh, that's something we have built a program around uh, to help soldiers at our clinic in, uh, in Scottsdale, performance recovery or performance IOP. We help first responders that um, are self-medicating because using different kinds of substances uh, because it's such an unpleasant experience to live in their bodies. After stressful events, uh, we have negative emotions as we all know about. And a way to deal with that is uh, self-medicating. So we build a program where we help their nervous system to downregulate, recovery of themselves, uh, and then how to move to resilience. So this program kind of, and that, yeah. So throughout the lecture today, we'll talk about a few different modalities that kind of help the nervous system uh, to go through uh, fight, flight, freeze, and recover. Um, I worked with a few, quite a few different modalities uh, from more talk therapy to more body psychotherapy. And I can see that the, the system that kind of explains the success in, in all these different fields uh, is the nervous system. The, the better we understand it, the easier it is to understand why therapy is successful 
it's my experience. So let's let's go ahead here. So so if we think about three sections in the nervous system, uh, one is safety when we feel safe. One is when we a bit more stressed, and then life threatening. So imagine that we drive through an intersection. We in our car, and it's uh, uh, green uh, when we drive through. Then that means it's safe. Uh, most cases, no one will drive there. We can sit and talk with uh, uh, our partner or family member or a friend. We can be socially oriented on what we're talking about. Of course, we need to focus a little bit what's going on, but still we can sit and talk. But then let's say the next intersection, um, we happen to go through orange or yellow, or even so that you might sit in a cab and the cab driver all of a sudden go through when it's yellow. All of a sudden we start feeling this might not be safe. Uh, and we upregulate our nervous system to, to kind of uh, deal with this external danger. So we leave introspection, this peaceful state, maybe social engagement, and we need to be aware of what happens outside. Often this kind of causes some uh, subtle feelings of anxiety, which helps us kind of to then start thinking what's wrong. But let's say we go through this intersection as well. Uh, and in the next, next intersection, the cab driver goes, charges through red, which could be life-threatening. And um, if that happens for a few, few occasions or we are experiencing stress for too long, then we have a separate nervous system uh, dealing with that. So what we can think of is for safety, we have one nervous system that develops a little bit later. When it's stress, we have a particular nervous system uh, helping us in, in dangerous situation. But if the danger is overwhelming or lasts for too long, we have a third ne nervous system that, that kicks in. So this is neurological defense mechanisms that evolved through millions of years, helping species, organisms to uh, evolve and gradually de develop new parts of the brain, white and gray matter expands, and then we have new behaviors. So we even see different parts of the brain uh, relating to these mechanisms. But before we uh, talk more specific about the brain. Let's see what happened in the, in the body. Be because always, if we think 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, maybe a million years ago, always when it was dangerous, it related to movement. Today, we might experience danger or stress in front of a computer, and we disconnected from the idea of needing to move when we stressed. But back in the days, we always needed to move, either run away from something, hide, or we needed to defend ourselves, fight, or we, we uh, kind of give up, play dead, which is the freeze response. So it, it's actually the brain processing information and then immediately send signals to the body. So let's talk about a little bit about that before we move on to the, to the brain. So we have the stutter response. Uh, some scientists claim we, we are born with two fears. One is loud noises, and it kind of makes sense. Often experience th fear uh, when it's dark, often experience danger when it's dark. That's when perpetrators might be around in nature, um, chasing for, for a prey. Another fear is falling backwards. So the brain and the nervous system is wired to protect ourselves when we fall backwards. Words. It's the uh, starter response, starter reflex. It's an automatic reaction to protect vulnerable parts of the body. So today, when we sit in the front of the computer and we might receive a stressful email, immediately the brain sends signals to, to muscles around the eyes, jaw muscles, throat, throat uh, chest, pec muscles, so us and so forth on to contract in order to prepare to, to uh, uh, move or move away. So it makes sense to understand the body. And that is the research within the trauma field, as probably many of you know already. Uh, I work with a few people from the second, uh, from, from Vietnam soldiers. And for many years, they were told there's no way through trauma 
it's something you will live will live with forever. And the interesting part of that, what what researchers and clinicians have found is that if we only wa- wa- work with talking, it's difficult to heal the trauma. The reason for that is that we have older parts of the brain that are the parts that are reacting to danger and trauma. So if you think about the brain stem symbolized by my, my thumb here, that's the oldest part of the brain that developed. Then mammalians kind of developed the limbic system, more com- complex with amygdala and such. And then we humans, more thinking, new cortex, cognition, uh, thinking about the future and the past. But, but it's these regions that are highly activated when we stressed. And the later regions that develop later, they kind of disconnect a little bit. So we need to get into these regions when we work with trauma and severe stress because it, uh, they, as I said, triggered. But they are connected to uh, tension in the body because movement, these regions tell the body to move, for example, to protect, start the response. And uh, let's say if someone would come up to me now and be threatful with, let's say, a knife in a hand, I shouldn't respond by, yay, hello, welcome. Uh, great that you have a knife and you're angry with me. The opposite is supposed to happen and we go into the started response and it's these parts of the brain. So immediately, uh, in case of danger, uh, the core muscles of the body respond by pulling together and our instinctive defensive defense for survival is activated. And actually when this happens, uh, the brain changes the way it processes. So neocortex is not as important anymore. Instead, we depend on the older regions of the brain that have been dealing with stress, trauma, dangerous situations for millions of years, many millions of years. So we jump to the brain, a little quick one without going too deep into the brain. We can think about when it's dangerous, the brain that needs to process information really fast, sensory impression. So according to Joseph Ledeau, uh, uh, neuroscientist on the East Coast here in the United States, in New York City, I think. He, he measured the, the pathways in the brain and he discovered with, when it's dangerous, amygdala hijack, some people call it. We see something, we react, and then afterwards we might think, oh, what did I do? Let's say a bus is about to hit me. I just jump away. And then afterwards, oh, wow, lucky me, I survived you're driving in the car and something happens, another car might almost hit you and you just re- respond automatically. And, and that's the old parts of the brain. It takes about 12 milliseconds from, for the brain to perceive something, to just react. And that's fast processing. Neocortex is kind of downregulated. But then after stress, we want to activate the high road again, which is more helping us to respond. And I call it thinking deeper. It's more complex processing to, to meet challenges relating to today. But that actually takes twice as long time, about 40 milliseconds. But then we see something, we think a little bit, okay, a bus is coming. Should I jump to the left? Because I parked my car over there. Uh, or should I jump to the right because I'm meeting a friend over there? Like in danger, we don't have time to do those kind of decisions where we more think about things and respond. Instead, we just react really fast because it's more important to survive than knowing where we parked the car. Although afterwards, we kind of want the brain to come back to the high road where it can come uh, process more complex information. So when we are stressed, the body contracts the body, uh, the brain tells the body to contract, then the brain body kind of tells the brain that the danger is still there because we are tensed up, meaning the lion is probably still around and we kind of get stuck in, in the low road. And that's back to the importance of working with, with the body as well. Tension, relating to these parts of the brain, preparing the body to move away in the flight response. We uh, 
sense the trapezius, move away from the threat, start activating the masseter uh, dogs. You'll probably see they kind of bark when they want to show that their boundaries need to be protected, that the flight response, how it responds in the body. The psoas is a big stress muscle we'll talk a little bit more about. And then we have the fight response, the same thing. We kind of get into position where it's easy to move. If you, if you need to attack someone with straight knees or straight legs, it's very difficult to jump. If you would try that sometimes or just move really fast with straight legs, it's almost impossible. Instead, we need to move down in this position. So the fight response, similar movement, moving towards the threat. And then we have the freeze response, surrendering to the threat where, where um, the person on the left is actually in a situation where they're firing bullets. So then the old part of the brain takes over, sends signals to the body, really contract to protect vulnerable parts of the body as if a lion maybe or a, or a wolf or a dog would try to beat, um, bite him. He needs kind of to protect uh, the inner organs and the throat and such. In this situation, maybe it's better to move away, actually. But um, the freeze response is so strong often, so it's hard to kind of top down, uh, override it. To the right, we have a psycho-emotional trauma. A child also moving into the fetal position, seeking safety in a corner. Uh, the freeze response is activated, surrendering to the threat. So we see it in the body. Uh, how we react. And what we call, this is based on Dr. David Berselli's research. Uh, he's one of my teachers and, and friends. So in one of his books, he write about the stress muscles where he noticed that uh, when we are stressed, uh, we need to move into the uh, fight flight position and we use certain muscles to get there. He is also a massage therapist, so he was very interested in seeing how tension, or is interested in seeing how tension in our bodies look with people that have been, let's say, in war versus people that don't experience that much stress or trauma. So we have the uh, muscles around our eyes. What they do is kind of help us to focus versus having peripheral vision when we fully relax. The masseter, bite, dogs bite. Stanoclade mustard ears, move the head like this, protect the throat. Trapezius, bring up the shoulders, the pecs moving in like this. Diaphragm uh, is affected because we need to breathe much more intensely and all the assisting breathing muscles as well. Then we have the QL and here the psoas, the major stress muscles, especially the psoas that kind of connects the upper body with the lower body, the adductors. So when we stress, immediately the brain sends signals to these muscles to contract. And here's David, Dr. Berselli, a book I highly recommend, uh, The Revolutionary Trauma Release Process. He developed a method called TRE that we'll talk a little bit about, which is actually uh, where he works with tremors and understand tremors, the purpose of tre tremors even more in resetting the fight flight mechanism. We get back to this. So here we have the SOAS. So I remember when I worked in Afghanistan, we were highly stressed. Uh, we didn't sleep that much. Uh, I was there for three, four months in the beginning of 2002. But when I came home, uh, my sister took a photo of me from the side and I like, oh, look at that. My belly was kind of like much bigger than I expected it to be. And I couldn't understand how come all of a sudden my posture got so poor. And uh, later on, I realized that when we stressed, the psoas contracts and it connects to the five lower vertebrae, pulling it together. And that, of course, can create uh, lower back problems with the discs being compressed. So that took quite a while for, for my muscles to relax when I came home from Afghanistan. I remember driving the car, and all of a sudden, I, I, or, or getting in the car, I could feel my, my quads just contracted. 
And I was thinking to myself, okay, exhale, relax your quads, and then you can drive. Like I was able to drive, but it was still tensing up. But after a few seconds again, 10, 20 seconds, it just contracted again. So the brain kept sending signals to the body, tense up, tense up, tense up, because I hadn't completed all the sensory data I needed to process from being in a war zone. The experience I had back there, the questions I had coming back, uh, feeling disillusionized about a, a lot of things. So I needed time to kind of process thoughts, emotions, experiences, putting that into picture, what I thought about the world before and what I thought about the world afterwards what I thought about me before and what I thought about me afterwards. Uh, that introspection and, and becoming a new version of ourselves. But it, it started with the body that behaved uh, strangely. Another thing was due to all the tension in my muscles, in my fascia tissue, nighttime, it was itching, uh, like restless leg syndrome. So it was hard to sleep. Instead, in order then, uh, instead of laying in the bed and sweating and not being able to sleep. The natural thing was for me was to go out and walk. So I walked around in Stockholm, uh, where I used to live in the city of Stockholm. And it kind of helped the body to discharge a little bit again. Like my brother, he was running away, helped the body to discharge all the built up energy. And afterwards, the brain kind of realized, okay, you completed fight flight. Same with me. I walked a few hours every night, came back in the morning, and then I was able to sleep for a few hours. I slept daytime, kept doing that for four, five, six weeks, and eventually the nervous system had calmed down, down-regulated. I processed a lot of some of the experiences and thoughts I had, and it was easier to be relaxed in the body. But the psoas is a key stress and trauma muscle. Um, we, we worked a little bit with American soldiers, teaching them a few exercises to work with releasing tension in the body that they do while being stationed overseas. And uh, in this experiment was about a thousand soldiers who worked with them building resiliency skills before deploying to Iraq. They had to do it over there. And then when they came back, very interesting result was that the, the, the severity of lower back problem was much, much lower compared to other groups. And also the prevalence of PTSD was, was much lower. So helping us to kind of downregulate in a stressful situation, process the sensor, sensory data, helps to release the tension in the body, thus less lower back problem. All connected, these parts of the brain react, brainstem limbic system, telling the body to contract, but when the body is contract, it keeps telling the brain, the threat is still here. So have a negative feedback loop. Stressed brain, stressed uh, tensed muscles. And um, what I then, or what's taught by other clinicians, and uh, I discovered with, a, with a, some of the Vietnam soldiers I worked with was, if we start with the body sometimes, it helps to relax the brain, and then it's easier to start uh, working with emotions relating to, to uh, the different events. And uh, that will bring us to the nervous system. So um, we're back to, to the intersection. Green, it's safe to drive through. Uh, yellow, it's dangerous to drive through. Or red, it's life-threatening. So we sit in a cab. If the cab driver drives through green, we can sit and talk with a friend. It's the social engagement system. We'll talk a little bit about Stephen Porges' uh, polyvagal theory. It is still a theory, uh, but there are a lot of interesting aspects to this theory. Uh, in, uh, a lot of research being made about the brain and the nervous system. 10, 20, 30 years, we'll know even more. Then maybe this is not a theory anymore, but it's still very interesting for us as clinicians to understand more about the polyvega theory. So uh, stress and life-threatening. Uh, and we, we can also think like these three segments of the nervous system has one function when we're safe 
and one function when we're stressful. So if we have the sympathetic nervous system, fight flight when it's danger, but if we're safe, uh, we still use the sympathetic nervous system to move around. Uh, same with uh, the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, freeze and faint. When we are safe, it's relating to rest and digest or feed and breed. Um, but now we're talking about in dangerous situation, how these nervous system are programmed to take over and help us survive. So three different systems. Some of, of you might think that, oh, I was taught Sympathetic nervous system, the gas, parasympathetic nervous system, the break, like that duality, just thinking left, right. Uh, while here we add a third, a third piece, the social engagement system, which actually is a part of um, the parasympathetic nervous system. But to make it easier, uh, we just call it social engagement system now. It's more uh, depicting better its functions. So. Just to philo genetically, philo means how different races, species developed through evolution uh, and developed the nervous system. And that's part of the polyvagal theory. So uh, the three different nervous systems have developed over time. If we think to the right, the parasympathetic nervous system is then nerves relating to digestion. Uh, if one wanna know more about the vagus nerve, it has an old, Part that's called the dorsal vagus nerve. It's not millionated, doesn't have that protective um, millionated sheets around. Um, and it's, it's uh, relating to sending information between the digestive system and the brain. And so this is the oldest nervous system. It developed many, many million years ago. And if I have that slide here. So it's back to the time when actually just depicting this, when you have multicellular organism or unicellular cellular organism floating around in the sea, food was coming to them and um, they didn't need to swim up to the food. They, they, they didn't have movement, just digesting food. And then gradually different species developed uh, and they were able to swim, but still the skeleton was softer, cartilage, which is a, a soft tissue, fascial uh, connective tissue. So, so it's not fully hard as bones. So that's the parasympathetic nervous system, just being able to digest food, live simplified. And then we have the sympathetic nervous system, that's nerves relating to movement. So over time, species develop and we realize oh well, we understand more about the world we can think and it's even better if i can swim up to food where i could move so then we develop the nerves and part of the brain relating to movement and in order to move if you think about it we often take it for granted we need muscles harder bones skeleton like mechanism biomechanics to be able to move and then nerves communicating between the brain and the muscles. So that's the a new part of the brain that kind of developed together with that. And that's sympathetic nervous system. We're able to move. Um, and then the latest nervous system is the social engagement system. That's nerves relating to communications and, and that developed much later. So when it's dangerous, we use the latest system first. So if this developed about 500 million years ago, this nervous system about 300 million years ago, of course, gradually, but here we have more bony fish, amphibians, reptiles, uh, the cartilage skeletons become hardened and they are able to move and swim up to their, 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 their food, so to say. And then we have the social engagement system, mammalians, we start, socializing in a different way, way. So about 80 million years ago, we started developing these parts of the brain and the nervous system. So relating to, uh, to, to stress then, we use the latest developed card first. So we have the social engagement system, prefrontal cortex, mirror neurons, 
So we're kind of able to read people's emotional state and such empathy. So when there's no stress danger, we drive through the green light. We can sit and talk with each other. All the three different parts of the brain and the nervous system, a little bit simplified, uh, act in unison. Then we start feeling that something is dangerous, might have a low sensation of anxiety. Okay, I need to think, why do I have anxiety? What's wrong? Start looking around, listening around, low levels of, of stress. Then we first use the social engagement system to engage with this situation, which is tend and befriend. If that doesn't work, we gradually start disconnecting the brain, go from high road, responding, thinking deeper about the situation to more reacting and reacting fast. And gradually with the muscles in the face that is relating to the social engagement system become more tensed. So we can hear it in the voice of people. We can see it around their eyes that they're more tense. The jaw muscles is more tensed. The breathing is a little bit different. So we see when a person loses social engagement. And that's something we can see in our clients as well. Uh, I'll show you a few photos in a bit, how they can move in between social engagement system and stress. And then we have, when this disconnect, we leave gradually social engagement. We move into flight fight. When it's stressful, when it's no stress, as I mentioned before, it supports daily activation. And then parasympathetic. If fight flight doesn't uh, help us to survive or escape, we have the oldest uh, card that we can pull or our nervous system can pull, which is the freeze faint. And that's what we can see in animals. I'll show you a few videos in a moment that they, um, uh, if they can't escape, a larger threat, they freeze up. Like it's often, you can see it in cats. I remember as a kid seeing our cat playing with a mice or a mouse. And I thought it was evil because it was playing it with it even though it was in total freeze response. But the animals don't want to eat dead animals, most animals, so it was probably trying to wake it up. But the mouse reverted to the oldest part of the brain, disconnecting frontal cortex, Limit about the limbic system, even of that, of course, that's active with the amygdala and such. And the brain stem preserves the, the oldest functions. So that's a little bit phylogenetically understanding how species over time develop our brain and nervous system so we, we can interact with a more complex world and have more complex behaviors. So, here back to the nervous system, the social engagement system on the baseline, sympathetic and parasympathetic. So social engagement is the lowest, the, the oldest, the newest system. When we're there, we feel positive emotions, uh, happiness, love, gratitude, compassion, might feel that we are in the zone. Um, this is often where we want to come back to build resilience. So we recover from the stress responses and want to gradually come back there. We'll, we'll talk more about this. And then flight, fight, we up regulate and then the freeze response. So if we think to the left and perceive levels of stress and danger, the left axis here is arousal, uh, adrenaline, cortisol, and so forth. So when we are feeling safe, this is very relevant for attachment theory as well. When, we, when my wife and I connect with our daughter uh, in the beginning, just to make her feel that this is a safe place and fulfilling her needs, doing our best to be socially engaged, having our nervous system at the baseline. We feel happiness, love, gratitude, compassion, and that's a safe environment for her. Some people call it being in the zone, but then something dangerous might happen. We might be stressed, we might work a little bit too hard. Then these emotions are being produced, anxiety first, fear and panic, or if it's the fight response, irritation, frustration, anger, rage. So we can think here, a person that experiences rage has much bigger chances of survival. If I'm a little bit irritated, uh, I might not use all my muscle force to, to protect myself. And there's this story some of you might have heard of, a mother's daughter is stuck under a car and she 
up regulate the nervous system up to really high let's say almost panic breathe intensely large amounts of um, adrenaline and the muscles fibers are so much stronger so she is able to lift the car high enough maybe not the car the, the wheels might not lift but high enough so that the, the, the child can be pulled out or, or crawl out. So the idea is the higher we upregulate flight, fight, panic or rage or under panic, fear, anger, the stronger we become, the less we think about communicating then, the more we become an animal. And it's here I work with a lot of soldiers that come back from a war zones having moral injury. Like they've done things in this state uh, that they can't forgive themselves for because they reverted to becoming more an animal. So then when they come back home and they downregulate into the tr trust and social engagement system and the brain is back to functioning more normal, they start assessing, what did I do? How could I do that? While when this is gradually turned off, disconnected, people might do things that we consider being more animalistic and then it's hard to forgive afterwards. Then psychoeducation is a big piece. We, we teach our clients to understand the nervous system so they understand the re their reactions, thus easier to forgive themselves. So if we stay, we can stay for too long here, wired and tired, racehorse, workhorse, flatliner. But what happens over time, the racehorse has a lot of energy, a lot of motivation, workhorse starting to get tired, and the flat line is when we've been for too long in a stress response, then we gradually start to lose our ability to feel. Because in a, in a war zone, when it's dangerous, um, we should be able to keep at it like for a long period of time. But in order to do that, we gradually lose the ability to feel feelings, positive and negatives. So it, it's hard to stay there for too long. And uh, just to see how the nervous system kind of reacts uh, in the fight flight. We have a video here with a polar bear who's escaping. We'll go for that one, Dennis. Here we have two here scientists in a helicopter. Pretty big bear. Bear activating here, the sympathetic Dennis? nervous system. Movement, running away from the threat. Intense breathing. looks around, kind of assess where is the threat, and eventually might go up into freeze response just because we can't escape the helicopter. See these, they have sedated the pads the there, it's sort of like, uh, like so we can think the freeze response, material, moving from fight to fight to freeze, rough, not really smooth. It helps them get uh, better traction on the ice. The oldest nervous system that just it's shuts right things almost down. Like a sandpaper. And then, of course, big claws for and breaking of in the seal completion of fight so freeze, really My brother was running away. And here we'll see the polar bear stimulating If you watch that animal after he running. finishes convulsing, you'll see because he's aware of the here's fact that we're all around breathing. him. And it's a very stressful and experience for an animal like a polar to, bear. Um, Come after he settles down, and then he'll start doing breathing. a couple of deep breaths, and then he'll breathe really nicely. And it'll really, now, look, here he goes. So what we think is that the animal and nervous see system here moving. resets from escape. And we see in slow motion, uh, Robert Scare, who's a trauma doctor, uh, have a, quite a lot of interesting books to read, but we interviewed him, me and a colleague a while ago, where he, and he gave us this video where he explained that he believes it's the animal simulating escape and completing all the sensory data relating to the stressful event and he receive, starts breathing deeper, diaphragmic breathing, then telling the brain the threat is over because you completed, you ran away to a safe place. Processing everything it heard, saw, if it's us hu humans thought and felt. And then afterwards we can imagine, instead of being reactive to a helicopter sound in the future, if we wouldn't have completed, it could be that the animal would, would revert to freeze response because it hasn't completed uh, the freeze response downregulated from it. So when it hears the helicopter again, it's triggered 
reverts back to the state, which is something we see in clients when they haven't completed uh, and, and deconditioned different responses. Um, so what, what uh, Robert Scare says, the freeze or immobility response is stored forever in the procedure memory unless it is released or the act of survival is completed through discharge. So procedure memory is the, the part of the brain or the parts of the brain that helps with movement procedures. And those parts of the brain keeps firing to the muscles, tense up until it has completed. Completed. That's why it sometimes it's difficult just with talk therapy when it comes to trauma, because it's hard to reach into these parts of the brain, is my experience. While then stretching as a way sends signals back, or why yoga, for as an example, can assist in some way, sends back to these information, back to these regions. Okay, we're stretching, we're opening up. I remember myself uh, coming back from Afghanistan and a few years later when I started working as a, as a therapist. I started doing yoga and these huge chest openers. And at this time I tried something called Bikram yoga, hot yoga. And it felt so good in the evenings, opening up the body again. I was very tight in my muscles. I started having problems running because my calves were too tight and such. And as I said, my, 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 my belly kind of um, had grown because of the tight psoas. So I started doing yoga. A physical therapist actually told me that if you don't fix your body, you'll have serious problems in a few years. Um, so I, I, I took his word and started stretching. It felt so good in the evening when I came home after stretching, opening up the, the body. Then the day after, I, and a few, sometimes two days after, I was feeling sad, so down. I, I didn't want to go to work. I, I just wanted to stay home and rest and recover. And my take on it today is the tension kind of held down, suppressed the emotions. And when I did the opposite, I started feeling more. The fascia system is a sensory organ. Uh, emotions start coming up. We start feeling the emotions better. And then the brain gets a chance to process it, complete the fight, flight, freeze. Uh, and, and, uh, and this is called the act of survival in that sense. When my brother escaped, he completed the act of survival. When the polar bear tremors, we call it neurogenic tremors, neurogenically induced tremors, that our hypothesis is that it helped the nervous system to reset down regulate. It needs more research in this field, but um, Dr. David Berselli has been working with it for about 20 years. We, we have a few studies one at the VA hospital here in, in Phoenix. I'll do my second PhD on this field. Uh, now in the process of uh, receiving my, my license here in Phoenix, Arizona as a psychologist. So, so I do my best to understand more, but it, it's quite fascinating that surviving and that's uh, completing the fight, the flight, the act of survival. Same as we saw in the boys, the boy escaped uh, with his class, didn't develop PTSD, probably because the nervous system throughout millions of years, if we escape, if we uh, fight our way through something, uh, freeze and then back to becoming alive again, then we learn, we grow post-traumatic growth. And that's the thing with the polar bear here, that when it's uh, trembling we'll through in the end, it's um, completing everything learning and that's uh, what my, my colleague David Berselli often says trauma is the fastest way to wisdom we either go under because it's so painful if we lose someone we love as an example so it might be easier to 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 give up or we find a new way to deal with the circumstances with the loss so we grow eventually but it's often what I often add to that Trauma, the fastest way to wisdom, but maybe also the most painful way to get there. It seems that pain, um, when it shadows us open, we start feeling more. And uh, in that sadness, in that loss, being present with it often, on the other side, it's the feeling of love at the same time, like being able to breathe through that. And when we, the baseline of the nervous system, it's easier. When we up fight flight, 
it's more difficult. Dr. So, Jones? Yes, please. Sorry, um, I just have a question and it, I think it kind of speaks to what you were just saying. Um, actually, we have a couple. Uh, the first one is, can a trauma produce a response of crying for negative as well as positive experiences? Uh, absolutely. So, so one way to view it is the subjective feeling can def is definitely either positive or negative or in between. From a, 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 a body perspective, as long as the client is in, within the window of tolerance, we can view it as the body releasing uh, the physical tension to it on a physical level, like the diaphragm is tremoring, that's the crying response. On an emotional level, we work with emotions, talking with them, breathing through them, as long as it's within the window of tolerance. And then on the cognitive level, we might have thoughts relating to it afterwards. So, so I think uh, the third perspective there is just to see them as positive and, and negative. Um, um, is more, more the experience, but from the nervous system, it, it's just something that is passing through, if that makes sense. Okay. To, to um, see it that way. And then the second question was, how does what you're presenting relate to what happens with EMDR? Yes, excellent question. So uh, we'll come to that in a little bit when we see a person um, processing, uh, like the polar bear, something old experience, but from my understanding, just worked a little bit with EMDR. It kind of helps us to get into a safe place. We feel safe with the client, uh, with a clinician. Uh, we are slightly distracted, so we don't get caught up in the events that needs to be um, processed. And then we allow the brain uh, to, to process the sensory impressions mentally, emotionally, a de trigger, and eventually the, the brain and the nervous system is back to the baseline. So I can, I can come back to that question in a bit when, when we talk about uh, processing uh, thoughts and emotions and such. Thank you. Any more questions, Debbie? Nope, those were the only two so far. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Okay, so let's jump over there. So we had the flight fight and can lead to the freeze response. Then we move from panic rage. So let's say panic and rage doesn't, doesn't we can't get through there. And we revert to the freeze response. Shame, trapped, helpless, meaningless. All the feelings we feel when being depressed or in PTSD. So if fight flight was energizing, when we're up here, it's, it's the opposite, it's, it's depressive. It's turning uh, emotions down through dissociation, numbness and immobility. And what we can think is if fight flight gives us a lot of energy in the body like this, freeze is, let's stop that movement. So one part of the body is moving, another part is like trying to stop the movement. And this takes a lot of energy. And I worked for two years measuring brain waves in stressed and depressed and people with PTSD. And we saw in freeze, the brain actually consumed twice as much energy as uh, fight flight in the temporal lobes. And in fight flight, the brain produced twice as much energy as in the social engagement system. So even if a person seems like they have no energy, the brain is consuming a lot of energy because it takes so much energy to be in the freeze state. And we can relate a little bit, like if you've seen a, a terror movie, horror movie, and you see the kids running up upstairs when the perpetrator is coming, they hide under the bed and uh, the music is playing, getting more uh, scary. They zoom in on the shoes when the person starts walking in. And if you were laying under this bed now, you would probably feel like, I want to run, but I have to lay still. I want to run and I want to lay still. So both system can be active. And that's what we see in, in people with about to have a burnout, that they are stuck in between these systems. Uh, we call it the PTSD addiction or burnout loop in that sense. Let's say Monday morning, I have to get back into uh, the sympathetic response. So I activate myself, 
uh, take a couple of cup of co coffees, maybe pep talk, get the system going. And then Monday evening or Friday evening, I'm exhausted, up in the red again, need to recover. Then it's Monday morning again, getting at it, or then weekend. So it's easy to get stuck here. And then we start self-medicating as an example. And the reason why it's easy to get stuck often is when we start riding the slope down here, if we up regulate when it's stressful, we want the nervous system to complete and down regulate. Here, we turn off strong emotions, become more numb. When we come back here, what do you think happens? We start feeling again, because our ability to feel is increased when we go from freeze to fight flight. Then we start often feeling what we felt before. And here is where a lot of people want to continue disconnecting, dissociating, because we don't have a way to get through there. And that's something we can teach our, our, our clients. How do they, through emotional management, breathe through their emotions? Instead of just feeling and then thinking and getting stuck, staying with emotions, breathing through, for example, using felt sense, if you're familiar with Eugene Jenlin's works, or name it to tame it, a lot of research. If you feel the emotion, put the name to it. We can stay with emotion within the window of tolerance. So here is the difficulty to go from freeze through fight flight and complete the fight flight freeze mechanism and then come back to the social engagement system. So um, that's what we can think about imaginary exposure therapy. We go back, I work sometimes with clients have been sexually abused and we go back in, when they feel ready for it and they save themselves with people they have in their team. It could be friends or people they feel safe with. They go back and save the little child as part of the process as a way to complete the fight, flight, freeze. And it seems to help the brain to even faster process the sensor data to it. Or we have the neurogenic tremors that also seem to help down regulating that's more a bottom-up approach from body, emotions, thoughts. Or EMDR seems to do the same. Allow the client to feel safe, be in the window of tolerance, the nervous system, the brain can process everything relating to the sensory impressions. And we're back at the social engagement system. So freeze, fight, flight, and trust and social engagement. For us as clinicians, it's very important in that sense also that our nervous system is down here because research has shown that the more we are down here working with the client, the easier it is for the client to co-regulate with our nervous system. And especially going through here, it, it, it's crucial with the client to co-regulating because just as we are here, if we're with very stressed people, through something called limbic resonance, our nervous system might be more stressed. Uh, we even saw it when we measured brain waves that, that uh, kids with the ADHD, they had often um, the same brain profile as their parents with regard to being stuck in this wired and tired stress response for too long. The parents were able to cope with it, that their brain being in a slightly low road high road, a little bit disconnected, but the kids weren't able to cope with it. So on a neurological uh, perspective, we react to the stress of other people around us. The opposite through co-regulation, we co-regulate through rapport and alliance with more healthy nervous system. And then we gradually feel more resilient. So what we work with our clients is first to down-regulate the nervous system and teach them how on a weekly and daily basis, downregulate here using different modalities. But we see it a little bit like we br brush our teeth uh, every day, a couple of times, hopefully. It's not like we spend Sundays brushing our teeth for two hours and think, okay, now I'm done for this week. Perfect. That's our view a little bit on the nervous system. That today we are experiencing so much more stress. The amount of stressors today is thousand folds more than before. We work longer, electricity, light, different kind of food, and so on. Um, so the nervous system is not really developed for this. It takes 
very long time for the nervous system to change and develop. Uh, but it has, so it hasn't fully adapted to the amount of stressors we experience today. So it's very easy to get stuck up here. And if we're stuck for too long in, in a prolonged stress response, sometimes the uh, freeze response is activated because we feel imprisoned in a social cultural cage and we can't get out of it. And then the nervous system decides, okay, activate the freeze response. And the psychological level, we might feel depressed uh, or, or PTSD, anxiety, and such. Dr. Jonas, quick question yes. again. Um, normally, how long should freeze, fight, or flight symptoms last? Um, days, weeks, months, years? Yeah, no, uh, good question. I, I think it's ideally we would like to come out of the freeze as soon as possible, as soon as we, we feel safe. The key is we need to feel safe. Uh, but today it's easy to get stuck there for, for too long, but the nervous system is not really built for being in these systems for too long. If you are in dangerous situation, it can last forever, very long time, but it's very taxing on the nervous system and the feelings connected to social engagement, happiness, love and gratitude is often then exchanged to, to other feelings that are more experience as negative. And we might be very motivated, having motives for what we do, having thoughts for what we do, and we can think ourselves happy, but it's less a uh, feeling of the, being inspired, being, being in our bodies uh, at the social engagement system. So ideally, as short as possible, but people that need to be in environments where they are stressed for a longer period of time. A couple of weeks ago, I was up at the Falsam Prism prison in California meeting uh, the, the correction officers how to work with them on downregulating their nervous system. They are in a war zone on a daily basis. They need to teach, learn skills uh, to downregulate all the time. Um, brushing their teeth a little bit every day on a, from a neurobiological perspective. Interesting. And then um, one other question, is there a particular type of yoga or physical program specific to the stress trauma release? And that's the only other question. Good question. I personally think it, the key is to find something that you enjoy doing so you can do it for more than 30 days. So I, I, different kind of yoga fits different people depending on uh, who we are and what we like. So, so I would say, I call it joyful discipline, finding something that you can have the discipline to maintain but it has to be joyful so you can do it for a longer period of time. Personally, I really like and like yin yoga because I needed more time in the stretching positions because my muscles were so tight. So uh, for you who are going to do the CEU and you other people that want to want to try the neurogenic tremors, we do a few stretching there that are inspired from yin yoga. Um, but we also work with self-myofascial release tools uh, to kind of self-massage the muscles and the stress muscles to open up, as an example, the thoracic spine and traps. So we combine that in, 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 in a methodology I call waving, you know, methodology for resilience and recovery, different, different tools we put in there. All right, so let's uh, just once again see uh, a cheetah here in a freeze response. You can see this is not the state we're supposed to be in for too long. It's more evident in animals. The animal is looks like it's fully dead. Then the perpetrator comes unsure: is this a dead animal or not? And then we have disturbing elements here. And eventually the cheetah is now down-regulating on the Bell's curve we saw the nervous system before, coming from freeze alive. Going back to breathing more intensely, completing all those signals from the brain to the body to breathe more intensely, and then gradually coming back to the baseline. Once again, we will see the neurogenic tremors being activated, but it happens gradually. The animal here is still perceiving if it's safe or not to be there. Ears and eyes are 
processing all the information to determine, am I safe here? Could I stay here and tremor here? Gradually, the body is coming alive, working together with the brain to release the sensory impressions. So the tremors is actually more the brain working and then the body is like experiencing the effects of it. Because as we said before, fight, flight, freeze, danger is always related to movement in nature. And we humans are also part of nature. So, so we work the same way in that sense. And gradually here it subsides and we'll see the cheetah run away. And when we teach this to soldiers, they, it kind of looks the same almost. Sometimes it's just in the legs and after a while, five, 10 times, it, it actually moves through the spine. And in the end, they feel very relaxed, start sleeping deeper because the nervous system goes from being vigilant to social engagement. And back, back at the baseline. So nature, we have developed a nervous system that can deal with trauma, life-threatening situations. And then where is my cheetah? So here's Robert Scare. Um, he describes these tremors as an automatic response from the brainstem, part of the procedural memory, and complete and discharge the fight, fight, freeze. So since my brother escaped, or the boy in the, boy in the school escaped, they were not locked into, they were not stuck in a freeze response. So then they didn't need to tremor. Although, as you probably experienced, yourself or seeing other people, after intense events, the body might shake just as a way to discharge. When uh, my sister gave birth afterwards, she automatically just tremored. My wife was bitten by a dog a few years ago. Right afterwards, she just tremored. And since we knew about it, she just laid on the floor and I sat next to her and uh, put a, like a blanket over her. But she could complete the tremoring after the stressful event. To, to help the brain to complete um, uh, that experience. Part of the genetic composition and it also achieve extinction of the conditioned sensory motor responses. So I work with soldiers when we also use these tremors. I, sometimes I see their trigger finger starts releasing. A few weeks ago, I, I taught it to my colleague. He spends a lot of time on his phone and then dialing and being stressed sometimes. So his legs started tremoring and actually his hand started tremoring just because for him, stress is connected to the movement in his hand because he, he, that's the muscles he's using. So let's see here. Uh, we talked a little bit about through our experiences, we, 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 we have unresolved sensory impressions. Here I call them junk data, ones and zeros. They don't, might not make sense in the beginning, but when they processed, they make sense and can interpret our experience and thus grow wiser. So back in the days in my hometown, Karlskrona in Sweden, I remember reading in the newspaper when I was about 10 years old that um, uh, the Germans during the end of second world war, they had dropped mustard gas in the Baltic sea. And in the late eighties, the containers of the mustard gas had eroded and the mustard gas came up into the Baltic Sea and killed a lot of the cod, which was big in my city. Uh, fishers caught cod and we ate it, but then that was poison. And, and, and we can think about it. We can suppress toxins, stress in this case, we can think for a while, but eventually nature kind of dissolves those walls. Same with intense experiences, the brain needs to complete the processing. A little bit, let's say you run up 10 stairs or 10 uh, levels in a building. Up there, you're really exhausted. <sighs> you can't just stop breathing. You need to complete that experience by, and eventually the pulse rate decreases, the breathing decreases. And same with our experiences. Thoughts needs to be completed. Feelings needs to be completed physical tension in this uh, setting, according to the nervous system. And what we can think then is this integration of sensory data, when we're really stressed, coming back from war zones or living in a war zone, 
uh, or being in a relationship that feels like a war zone. To cope with it, we put up dissociative barriers. And a little bit the question before, how long can we be uh, in a freeze or fight flight? People can live there forever. I call that being stuck in fight flight or stuck in freeze. And they're so used to it. So, so they might not know how it feels to, to be in a different state. But when we start working, when I start doing yoga, so, as, as an example, when you work with your clients through your modalities, when they start feeling safe, down-regulating, the dissociative bar barriers are gradually removed. We move from rigidity and numbness, start feeling more, riding down the slope. And, and that's what we're gonna see a little bit uh, in this video with uh, a Navy SEAL soldier. He had been in, uh, in a few different wars. He had these barriers and he felt kind of awful on and off, worked with himself intensely. And uh, in this here, he has just used the tremors because uh, it's something they can use themselves after a while when they learn how to, how to use it and they show that they can be within the window of tolerance and such. So then the dissociative barriers has gradually diminished for him, which often happens for soldiers when they come home to their family and start feeling safe. But then it's chaos, all the so thoughts and feelings and such. So let's listen to what he says, and then we'll come back to that. I started to experience this tremoring in, in my core. Like I started shaking uncontrollably in my core, which kind of felt good. It, 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 was, it was a good releasing type movement almost like a autonomic massage so this like looks a little bit more intense muscles. most people it, it's not this intense body. as it is for him and but he's done it quite a few times and then it worked directly up into my shoulders where i presume that i have trauma stored and at first it was just one shoulder then it was both shoulders and then it started to be my hips and my shoulders and then it became this this convulsing forward, which you saw in the video. And it's interesting because what we put together is that my experience with the roadside IED going off was that I probably, I was in a turret, I was facing this way, and I probably, when the blast went off, pulled over this way, which brings that one shoulder into it, and I started trembling. And then as I breathed into the effect more, I started to have emotions come up with it and, and memories and happened was this, it was almost like a gas escaping from, from my body. It, it, that's the only way I can describe it. And it was incredible. It, it, something left and I'm not sure exactly what it was, but the whole experience overall was incredible when i got done i was incredibly relaxed i had some of the best sleep i've ever had so this is michael vega describing then uh, how he was able to process sensory data relating to war situation a blast he used his body in a certain way and it stuck in all parts of the brain that he's able to kind of uh, access and allow the sensory data to be processed so the dissociative barriers are removed and we can think about thoughts feelings physical sensations and pa past ideas memories as pieces of a puzzle that need to be integrated through emdr and different modalities we assist in this process and when that happens the nervous system can move down from freeze fight flight to social engagement we move from rigidity and numbness to starting feeling the emotions we feel naturally on the baseline, which is more being satisfied, grateful, love and connection, because we're back in the social engagement system. Up there, it's easier to relate to the people around us versus feeling like when we go through an intersection and it's dangerous because the, the driver drives through there and it's yellow and uh, red. We, we, instead of being vigilant on external threats, feeling anxiety and wondering what's wrong, we can start feeling pleasant and connect with the people around us. So when we work with soldiers down regulating the nervous system first, they might not wanna to talk to us 
Same with me when I came from war zones. I didn't want to talk to therapists because it took too long time to, to put them in, in understanding what I've gone through. Same when we work with soldiers and probably what you feel with clients sometimes, they're a little bit vigilant. We lead them through the neurogenic tremors sometimes and they start feeling safe in themselves. And then they start sharing with each other in the body system. And that kind of reinforces social engagement because they start sharing with someone who's also temporarily downregulated. And then they are interested in working with us because they had an experience. So thoughts, feelings, sensations become more integrated. We have a lot of different modalities that support that movement complete and completing fight, flight, freeze. Let's skip that, that as well. So if we think about it, we can have this process, all the junk data, stressful events, stressful and traumatic events often have strong arousal leading to sensory impressions being stored fragmentally in various parts of the brain and the nervous system, in the body's physical tension, emotions, feelings, or, uh, and uh, cognitive uh, thoughts. Then non-present sensory impressions are being felt sensed, integrated with older experiences. As uh, the Navy SEAL soldier described, he started having memories and feelings and physical movements when these older parts of the brain is, is uh, integrating the experiences. And then afterwards, we have new insights, lessons learned, can see the whole experience. And being on the baseline, we can feel grateful for it, even though we might not want to redo it. And in, 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 in the trauma work I work for, my wife and I, she's a psychologist, we teach critical incident courses. It, it's, we often talk about post-traumatic growth. And my wife often describes that we become version 2.0. The new person we become, we don't want to not be that person we have become, but we might not want to experience what we went through. Like the, 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 that's the gift of a trauma when we're on the other side. And for us as clinicians, when we see these people suffering, knowing that on the other side, they are, they become something they, they want to uh, not be without. Felt senses, according to Gendlin, he called this when, when we're able to stay in our emotions and, and process um, the emotion, the sensory data, while the nervous system is down-regulating. So with that said, uh, I would uh, have to invite you for some questions regarding this. And uh, I can't say this before. Um, let's see, we did have... Um... When, well, and we also, um, someone asked, what is Wave Nation? So, okay, yes. If so, you want to do that one. And then the, the other question was um, asking about, like, how can we help individuals who are experiencing, like, ongoing trauma, like racial trauma or, you know, the non supportive legal system for um, victims of sexual assault? Oh, sorry, those are two. Yeah, yeah, we can begin with uh, <laughs> Wave Nation then. So what we put in, put in our program, the Recovery and Resilience Program, is different modalities where the, the neurogenic tremors is one aspect. We call it the good vibrations there because we want to focus more on resilience, the recovery, and then the new person we're becoming. So uh, I'm going to give you a link, but on this slide, which would be on the, in the handouts, uh, especially for those of you who want to have the continuing education units, you'll use this uh, link to access uh, where you can test a guided meditation where, we, where you are guided to activate the tremors. You do a few stretches, you lay on a yoga mat, put, you, put your knees out to the side, the adductors become a little bit fatigued, and then the leg starts tremoring, and then you stretch your legs and the tremor stops but it's a way to test these neurogenic tremors. Uh, and then there are a few questions regarding that afterwards that, that's in the, in the handouts as well. And, and then you send that to Debbie, Aurora, and, and in order to receive your continuing education units. So Wave Nation and Waben is, is just where we, what our company is called, where we provide education in recovery, 
resilience using the neurogenic tremors together with a few other modalities. And if you would be interested to know more, uh, we have an online course uh, starting October, five modules, more about the nervous system, neurogenic tremors, the brain, how the brain processes stress and trauma, a bit about the insula, how the brain reacts to unpleasant sensory impressions, the fascia system, uh, new research shows how that's involved in, in, in feeling and as a sensory organ, and um, then how we can use the neurogenic tremors as a resilience and recovery method. But I, I can put some links to it. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, regarding sexual trauma, we often use actually the tremors in that setting as well, uh, talking to the client, working with them. And then when, when it's the right time, and if they feel like they want to work with the neurogenic tremors, we introduce that to them as well. Um, and often they have uh, good experiences with it. It's important to stay within the window of, of uh, tolerance and kind of titrate and self-regulate in the beginning because the tremors can sometimes remind them of past experiences. Uh, so I also work with uh, imaginary uh, exposure therapy. We go back to the experiences and more top down, get into the emotions and, and establish safety from within. So uh, that's a little bit connected to the sexual trauma. There was one more question there, Debbie, relating to that. Uh, um, there was, uh, how do tremors, um, oh, that one was regarding um, like racial trauma. So people who are continually experiencing racial trauma, is there, you know, I guess, how can this help them? Well, uh, just as, racial trauma, like it, it creates that divide. We can relate it to today actually that we see so much um, in our society, the division between groups today, which is a little bit same as racial trauma, but in a different way. Uh, that kind of makes us stuck in the fight flight. And in fight flight, we are supposed to view the world black and white, right and wrong, friend and foe, so by down-regulating the nervous system, it helps us to get into a place where we can experience that racial trauma differently. Just as an example, a colleague of me, me David Berselli, worked in Israel and we worked with the Palestines and the Israeli. First, he had them to talk about their experience, um, uh, about the other side, and, and it didn't work at all because they could just see their perspective being angry with the other part. Then at this second meeting, he had them do the tremors first, where they felt more safe within. And then they had, he had two and two talk again about their different perspectives. What was very interesting was when they down-regulated for a while, they felt safe within, they were able to listen to the other perspective and understand, oh, you feel the same way I feel. Right and wrong is not important anymore. It's more understanding, empathy, and that's the social engagement system. But if we're not in the social engagement system, we're wired to think division, right and wrong. Uh, same in counseling sessions, doesn't matter who's right and wrong in the couple therapy, it, it's having that third perspective down to down regulation, social engagement, where you can see uh, how do we get through this to a new result. But it, it all comes back to the brain has to be able to have the gear in where it can heal uh, versus protective fight, flight, right and wrong. Well, perfect. We're actually just coming up here on our time for the day. Um, so at this point in time, we do want to be mindful of your day, everybody. We hope that whatever you're doing after this, you have a great rest of your day. Um, just a reminder, uh, and I'm just going to say it, thank you again, Dr. Nordstrom, for a wonderful presentation. There were so many chats in the comment, um, just speaking to your, your level of expertise in the subject matter. And so we, we greatly thank you for sharing that, that time here with us. Um, were there any other last thoughts on the presentation or anything like that um, before we wrap up? No, I just want to extend my, my gratitude to Aurora, Debbie, Jordan, for 
giving me a chance to talk about this subject. Uh, thank you for everyone listening, having the patience, um, and hope I really hope you learned a lot. And if you're interested, please feel free to reach out to me. I posted two links. Uh, one is where everyone can access the Waving webinar, where you can try the the neurogenic tremors. Um, my email is in the presentation if you have questions for me. Otherwise, I wish you a wonderful day and uh, a good future in these crazy times. <laughs> well, thank you again so much. Uh